We're now going to focus on breastfeeding. Our next speaker is Dr. Lawrence Noble. Since completing his neonatal his neonatology fellowship at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. Dr. Noble has worked as a pediatrician and neonatologist in New York City at Elmhurst Hospital and at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He is the protocol chair of the section on breastfeeding of the American Academy of Pediatrics um, and serves as secretary to the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine in addition to acting as co-chair of the Bronx Breastfeeding Coalition and member of the editorial board of the Journal of Breastfeeding Medicine. Dr. Noble will be talking about breastfeeding and epigenetics, long-term health and inheritance effects of feeding human milk. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lawrence Noble. Thank you everyone for being here and for sort of sitting through all these talks. I don't know how you do it. Um, we're going to have fun right now. We're going to just talk about breastfeeding and its importance and some of the effects of breastfeeding on our babies. In the beginning of last year, Lancet came out with this landmark series of articles about breastfeeding. And after multiple meta-analyses, uh, they concluded that if we improved breastfeeding around the world, we could prevent over 800,000 annual deaths of infants and children less than the year of five worldwide every single year. They concluded that we could reduce the United States annual medical costs by almost $2.5 billion every single year. Um, uh, their other conclusions were medical. They found that we would improve children's IQ in children and adolescents, which of course means in adults eventually. We could decrease obesity, which we just heard this morning is a major problem. Um, and we could decrease childhood leukemia. And that's just the children, the effect on children. Obviously, there are also effects on mothers. But my question to you today is how does this short nutritional intervention called breastfeeding in the perinatal period have a profound effect on long-term health? I mean, let's face it. How long do our moms really breastfeed their infants? Three months, six months? Our better mo moms do it for nine months, 12 months, a year, two years, three years? Eventually, every mom has to stop. And the question is, how could what's a short, a relatively short nutritional intervention make such a big difference on the long-term health of children? How can that happen? And what I'm hoping to convince you through this morning's talk is that epigenetics and breast milk plays a huge role in terms of that. We all know what genetics is, right? We all learned about it, even those with, of us with gray hair learned about genetics. We have DNA, which goes to RNA, which goes to the proteins, and the proteins determine what our phenotype will be, how we actually turn out. Epigenetics is different. Epigenetics states that it's not necessarily what we learned in school, that it's not all nature versus nurture, but it's actually the combination of the two of them. Not everything is based on chromosomes. Epigenetics modulates how you're supposed to be genetically and determines how you turn out based upon your environment. Um, epigenetics is a relatively new field, but it's actually based upon some old science. And this is one of the classic papers in terms of epigenetics. It's based on the Dutch famine of 1944. In the middle of World War II in Holland, there was a terrible famine where people starved. And when they measured mothers who were pregnant during this terrible famine, what they found was that if a mom was pregnant in her second or third trimester during this short period of a horrible starvation, then what they found was the babies were born small, and that's to be expected, because the second and third trimester is when the fetus grows the most. But even though the babies were born small, when those babies grew up, 
and they had children of, of their own, those were babies that were born were normal size. So second or third trimester, babies born small, but their children were normal size. But this is where it gets really interesting. When they looked at the moms that were pregnant in the first trimester, during this acute starvation, during this famine, what they found was, as expected, their babies were born small because they had a lot of time to catch up in terms of their growth because there was more food later on during the pregnancy. But what wasn't expected was, when those infants grew up and had children of their own, those children were often, SGA, were often small for gestational age. So what we see is, if the moms were pregnant, in the first trimester, their babies were normal size, but the children of those babies ended up being small for gestational age. So what we see here is a nutritional intervention and a relatively short nutritional intervention. We don't usually think of a famine as a nutritional intervention. It's a little bit acute, a little bit serious, but what we see is a nutritional intervention that made a change that somehow affected not only the mom and not only her fetus and infant, but actually went to the third generation, to the children of those children. And all of a sudden we see an effect that doesn't change the genetics, but changes the epigenetics, which can go, go from one generation to another. The molecular basis of epigenetics is based on two processes. The first one and most important is called DNA methylation. DNA, as you know, is, is made up of four nucleotides, and one of them is cytosine. And if you methylate that cytosine, what happens is you turn off the gene. So everyone has to remember, so they understand the next part of the talk, that DNA methylation turns off a gene. The other basic mechanism of epigenetics is histomodification. DNA strands are extremely long, and these long strands have to fit in every one of our nuclei and every one of our cells. And the way this happens is it's actually tightly wound around these histones. And in this picture, the histones are, are, are drawn as footballs, because of course we're in football season here in Chicago. And, and it's wound about tightly so it could fit into each one of those cells. And what epigenetics does, it modifies those histones. And by modifying those histones, it actually makes DNA more open or closed, increasing or decreasing gene expression by doing that. So again, DNA methylation, histone modification, DNA methylation turns off a gene. And here we see a picture of monozygotic twins on your left. Um, and they assure me that these are monozygotic twins, and their hair hasn't been dyed, but as you can see, they look alike, but they have different colored hair. Obviously, they have the same genetics, but somehow different epigenetics. And in the other picture, you see monozygotic mice, and as you can see, nobody dyed their fur, but the fur is different colors. So obviously, this is not a genetic change, but somehow it's an epigenetic change. Once epigenetics is established, it sort of lasts through the life of a person, and it can actually be inherited, as we saw in the Dutch study, where we saw it inherited up to three generations. In animal research, it's been demonstrated that can be inherited up to five generations. Now, breast milk has within it RNA, and they're small RNA. They're much smaller than the RNA we're used to. They're much smaller than messenger RNA or ribosomal RNA. And the red line shows the RNA and, and the size of the RNA in different, in, in breast milk. But we're going to focus on that little blip that you see in the blue circle. Everyone see that blue circle and that little blip? That little blip is microRNA. It's tiny little RNA that's only 20 to 25 nucleotides in size. And interestingly enough, breast milk contains within it more microRNA than any other body fluid. So obviously, it has an important role to play. There are 1.3 times 10 to the 7 copies per liter per day given to a breastfed infant. Um, so he's getting much of this microRNA. Um, this slide shows you um, breast milk from three different moms, the microRNA, and just get a gestalt for each mom, we're showing you two pictures of the microRNA. And if you look at the colors, you can see 
the two pictures in a row from each mom sort of look the same, but from each mom to mom, there's a lot of variation. So moms actually vary. Their micro, moms tend to have the same microRNA, but it tends to vary between different moms. So moms are stable, but between them it varies. Now what's the role of microRNA? And this graph sort of, sh this picture sort of shows it. If you start off in the left-hand side, side that what we see in the left upper part of this slide is the mature microRNA, the mi microRNA that's within breast milk. And if you follow down along, what you can see is that it actually influences epigenetic modulators. Um, and the epigenetic modulators then regulate epigenetics, the DNA methylation and the histone modification that we saw. Um, and then that epigenetics can modulate changes the DNA, turning on or turning off various genes um, in order to influence which DNA will produce RNA and then the proteins and how the baby will really turn out, the whole gene expression, the phenotype of that infant. And so let's think about this for a second. You're breastfeeding your baby, or a mom is breastfeeding her baby. What you're giving that baby is microRNA. What that microRNA can do is actually work on these epigenetic modulators and change the epigenetics, and therefore, therefore turn on or off certain genes. So this baby doesn't have to turn out exactly the way his genes say he can turn out. Breast milk can actually modulate that, that breast milk and maybe change things for the better for their baby. Um, but let's think about it for a second. Again, moms only breastfeed for a certain period of time. What happens when a mom stops breastfeeding her babies? And the answer is, as we saw, epigenetics tends to last. The epigenetics that is set up during that first crucial time when moms breastfeed that baby can last throughout the life of the babies and make sure that those, epi that, that those changes last throughout the lives and may even last for future generations when we think about it. Um, let's look at this study. This study was published in Pediatric Research in 2013. It's a study looking at breastfeeding and LEP methylation. LEP is the gene that produces leptin. Everyone in the, this audience probably knows about leptin. Leptin is the leptin is the hormone that increases satiety, that makes us feel full. So you take a big meal and all of a sudden you start eating and eating and at a certain point your leptin levels go up, they go to your hypothalamus and they say, you're full, stop eating. What scientists could do is they can create mice that don't have the gene, that LEP gene, and those mice never stop eating. They just keep eating and eating, and you see how they grow tremendously. So they looked at methylation of the LEP gene, and again, methylation means that you turn off that gene. And they looked on the bottom there in that, that duration of breastfeeding, which is in red. As you can see, duration of breastfeeding is significantly associated with methylation of the LEP gene. So, but it's a negative association, if you look carefully. So it's negatively association with, associated with the methylation of the LEP gene. Basically what that means is that, that the longer the mom breastfeeds her child, the more chance that the LEP gene will not be, will, the less chance that the LEP gene will be methylated. Okay, so the longer mom breastfeeds a child, the less chance that the LEP gene will be methylated. So the more chance that the LEP gene will be active. And therefore, when the baby starts eating, the baby will start, will produce leptin, the baby will get full, and therefore won't become overweight or obese. So here we see a mechanism, an epigenetic mechanism, that explains the relationship that we see with a short nutritional intervention of breastfeeding and later obesity or overweight because of the epigenetic change or not changing on the LEP gene. Um, other studies have found other significant effects of breastfeeding on, on methylation of various genes. The first study you see here is from 2013 and looked at the 17Q12 gene, which is an important gene in terms of development of asthma. And what it found was breastfeeding had a significant effect on that gene, but it was a positive effect on methylation. In other words, 
more breastfeeding or breastfeeding led to increased methylation of that gene. So therefore you turn off that gene and the expected outcome from that would be decreased asthma, which may reflect some of, of the relationships that are seen at least in some of the studies in terms of breastfeeding and asthma. And also quite interesting is the second study listed here, which looked at mother's genes. And it looked at methylation of three tumor genes in mothers and found, again, a positive effect of breastfeeding on increasing methylation of those tumor genes. Um, and may explain some of the decreased breast cancer that we see in moms that breastfeed their infants, because those genes are methylated and therefore don't cause cancer. But breast milk also has within it stem cells. We all know about stem cells, right? We all know that any day now, that's going to be the magic treatment that's going to help for multiple, multiple problems. You have someone with a spinal cord injury, and we're going to use stem cells to correct the problem. You have someone with kidney failure, and we can generate new kidneys for them with their own DNA. Um, you have someone you know, with, 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 who needs insulin, who's a diabetic, and you could produce a new pancreas. And any day, we're going to figure out what that is. And the amazing thing is that there's stem cells within breast milk, and those stem cells have the ability to produce multiple cells, just about every single cell that's important in a baby's body. And I, what I show you here is pictures of some neurons that were produced from breast milk stem cells. Infants ingest thousands to millions of viable stem cells with every single breastfeeding. And studies have shown they survive the neonatal gut, they get into the body of the neonate, they can be transported via the circulation to multiple organs in the baby. They invade the tissues of the offspring, and they can even differentiate into mature cells. And many people have said to themselves, like, what are these stem cells doing? There's a lot of them. What could they be doing? A bunch of us have speculated that there may be a role of these stem cells improving homeostasis and regeneration. Let's say you have some neurons in, an, in a baby's body that just aren't growing the way they should. Or you have some mild hypoxic damage to a baby's brain. Or somewhere else in the body something goes wrong. Maybe some of these stem cells can actually go to those areas and repair the damage before it gets too bad. And thereby, it may play a role in some of the effects of breastfeeding that we see on neurodevelopment and later IQ. But I think this talk can be summed up with this one slide. And in this slide, what we see is, uh, is this girl talking to her mother and saying, so I blame you for everything. Whose fault is that? The more we learn about the science of breast milk, the more we realize that the outcome of our children is related to, is the outcome of our children is dependent on whether or not their mothers can breastfeed their infants. And as this slide shows us, we blame our poor mothers for everything, including whether or not they can breastfeed their children, even if they try to breastfeed and unsuccessfully, we still blame our mothers. Our role as pediatricians is crucial. We pediatricians have to help our mothers so that they can succeed with whatever breastfeeding expectations they have in order to improve the outcomes and the health outcomes of our infants and our children. Thank you.